Well, how did you guys do for Valentine's Day this week, this past week? Did you fulfill your commitments uh, to proclaim the goal of our series? In fact, I want you to say this with me, if you would, this morning on the screen. I will create a Christ... I'm saying it by myself. You guys got to say it with me now. I will create a Christ-centered culture in my home that is stronger than the culture in this world. Now, folks, if that's an indication of how the rest of this sermon is going to go, you got to step it up for me here, okay? I, I hope you're doing well and looking forward uh, to this For the Love of series uh, from 1 Corinthians 13. It kind of culminates in what we're going to call For the Love of Family. And what we have is an invitation for families to participate in an evening of games and crafts and cookie decorating and more. But I want to dive into our passage today in, in 1 Corinthians 13, and then we're going to pray. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, says this, Love is patient, and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, and it is not self-seeking. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would add a blessing uh, to the reading of your word. We can't understand what this really means to us apart from your spirit. So, Father, I just ask you help us to interpret this rightly for ourselves, for the sake of our relationships, for the sake of our fellowship here, uh, as we seek to be those that love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love other people. Help us to get it right. Help us to bring you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start with a story about a guy named Dave who worked in an office and one day he was talking with his coworkers in the break room and he was saying, I know everybody. Anybody you name, I know. And his boss overheard him make that boast and he, he kind of got his hackles raised a little bit. Dave was the kind of employee that was always kind of flapping his gums. You know somebody like that? Uh, always kind of making grandiose claims. And so the boss stepped into the room. He said, I bet you don't know Tom Cruise. And Dave said, well, as a matter of fact, I was born in the same town as Tom Cruise. I've met him many times, and in fact, he and I are childhood friends. Right, said his boss. No, really, said Dave, and Dave got on his phone, he talked to somebody, and a couple of hours later, a limousine pulled up in front of the office building. They got into the limousine that took them to the airport, and they got into a, a small private charter jet and flew to, to the site where Tom Cruise was filming the next Mission Impossible movie. They got to watch it being filmed. They got to talk and share a good meal with Tom Cruise. And, and it was just awesome. And Dave was just grinning ear to ear. I told you so. I told you I know everybody. I know Tom Cruise. And the boss again was irritated. He said, Dave, you got lucky on that one. I'll give you that one. I'll bet you don't know LeBron James. <laughs> and Dave said, well, actually... I went to high school with LeBron James, and so he gets on his phone. A couple of hours later, a huge Cadillac Escalade appears, and they get into it, and again, they drive to the airport, and they get on a plane, and they're flown out to L.A., and they watch a game, and afterwards, they're invited into it. LeBron's yacht. They go out in the Pacific Ocean. They have this great surf and turf meal, and, and Dave is, again, grinning ear to ear. His boss is flabbergasted. He can't believe it. You know Tom Cruise. You know LeBron James. Okay, I, 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 I've got to do something to stump you. I'll bet you don't know the Pope. <laughs> and Dave said, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I did a mission down in Argentina, and I got to meet the Pope, and, and we became good friends. He said, no way. He said, yeah. And so Dave got on the phone again, and a plane showed up, and he and his boss flew to Rome. They're escorted to Vatican City by the Swiss Guard. And they arrived in that big courtyard outside uh, the, the main um, square where the Pope comes out upon the balcony and, and speaks to the crowd. And it's so crowded, Dave says, well, you know, I, I, I do know the Pope, but he's never going to see me down here. Wait just a minute. And he disappears into the crowd. And as the boss is standing there, the people around him start to applaud. And he looks up, and there's the Pope coming out. And standing right next to him is Dave. <laughs> And the Pope speaks, and then Dave comes back down. He finds his boss laying on the ground, passed out. He, he, he rouses him, and he says, what, what's going on? You have a heart attack? Are, are you sick? He goes, no, I, I can't believe it. I can't take this anymore. As soon as you walked out on the balcony, the guy next to me said, who's that guy in the funny hat next to Dave? <laughs> There's something about that story that speaks to me probably speaks to you as well. We all want to be like Dave, don't we? 
Would it be nice to be known by everybody? I mean, would it be nice to know and have connections like that? To be the kind of guy or gal that even celebrities would rearrange their day just to spend time with you? Would it be nice to have a life as the TV series that used to run uh, back in 1982 to 1993 with a total of 275 episodes used to begin every show with making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Remember the, remember the show? Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to go where everybody knows your name. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a life of meaning? There was like a psychologist, and you might remember from your Psych 101 class in college, by the name of Abraham Maslow. And back in 1943, he wrote this incredibly important paper called A Theory of Human Motivation. And in that paper, he outlined what was a concept that influenced counseling and psychology and even a religion for, for many, many years to come. He came up with this pyramid called this pyramid of, of needs. And basically, and, and I'm not, that's not the sermon this morning, but basically what he said was that people have these needs that long to be filled. First of all, you've got a need for food and shelter and clothing. And then above that on this pyramid, you've got a need for shel- uh, security, then love and family and, and so on. But at the top of that list was something he called self-actualization, which is just a fancy term for knowing yourself, living your calling, being who you were created to be and enjoying that life, becoming who you were meant to become, to have a life of meaning. It's something that we all want to have. We all want a life of meaning that's fulfilling. Now let me just say to you, a couple of years ago, when the Cincinnati Bible College, where I went to school, was still in existence, it had a publication. And I'd get it in the mail at church, and it would list all of the graduates, people that I went to school with. And I would get on Facebook and look up some of my old friends, and I would spend hours looking at them. And here's what I found. I found one of the guys that lived on my dorm room floor that literally went to work at a megachurch where all he does is he reads, he watches videos, and he gives illustrations and stories to the preacher to write into his sermon. That's his work. And he has traveled the world with this guy. When this preacher wrote books, he got published right along with him. Here's another guy I went to school with who was traveling in the Holy Land, and I always thought, man, I'd love to go to the Holy Land. And he takes his church, a group in his church, every other year to the Holy Land, and they'll go down to Petra and, and see where, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, was, was filmed. He'll go through Bethlehem where Jesus was born and Jerusalem and Mount Carmel where Elijah had the great uh, contest with the prophets of Baal. And, and, and he's fished in the Sea of Galilee. He's been baptized in the Jordan River. He has floated in the, in the Dead Sea. He has stood beneath the waterfall in En Gedi where David hid from Saul when Saul wanted to take his life. And I thought, man, I'd love to just go on one of those trips. And here he's going every other year, five trips so far with his church group. One of my friends recently bought a home in Alaska. You guys know him, Jason Roush. Uh, he's taken some amazing photos of the mountains there, of the glaciers, the northern lights. He goes on some incredible hikes in Alaska, and I want to go. And the more you know people like that, the more you read about people you went to school with, and and you think about your life, you begin to think, what have I done with my life? How come I didn't get to do all of these things in my life? And Facebook will definitely do that kind of thing to you. We're looking at the highlight reel of everybody else's lives and comparing it to our lives on a boring Thursday night. It wasn't meant to be like that, but somewhere deep inside is that need in every one of us. We want to know that our lives have depth and and meaning. We all want to believe our lives are fulfilling, but the question I want to have you answer today is this. Why is it so difficult to have a life that matters? Now, I could stand up here and give you a self-help talk this morning about the five easy steps to a fulfilling life for only three easy payments of $29.95 in order to unlock the secrets, but I'm not going to do that, obviously, because it actually comes from God's Word. 
It's what God intends for us to know. It is what he intends for us to have. And it came at the cost already of his son. We want to believe our lives are fulfilling. And it's outlined in that beautiful chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. Four lines only that we're going to look at today. Love does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. Some of your versions say it is not rude. And it is not self-seeking. Now, friends, those four lines form a picture. They form a future that the Apostle Paul is trying to steer this church in Corinth away from. Because whenever they got together for their worship services, everybody was just talking over each other. You ever been in a conversation like that? You're trying to talk to somebody, and before you can even finish, somebody else jumps in, and they're talking over top of you. Everybody had something to say. Everybody had a desire to be heard. Everybody wanted to be the leader. You ever try to fix a dinner when two or more people are in the kitchen, and everybody wants to be the head chef? Everybody wants to be the most interesting person in the room? And Paul writes this letter to set them straight, to bring order to the church and and to show them the way to really live life together as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus and he writes those four lines love does not boast it is not proud it is not rude and it is not self-seeking and the reason he writes that is because they're looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places they're looking for fulfillment in the world And, and, and this is the first thing there on your outline this morning the world looks fulfillment by asking what's best for me And I want to break this down by looking at these lines that Paul wrote. But again, real fulfillment, you know where it comes from. It comes from Jesus Christ. Being in Christ together in God's word. The psalmist said, it isn't Snickers that satisfies. Psalm 90 verse 14, God, you satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we can sing for joy and be glad all of our days. Whenever your heart sings like the man I told you about that I met on the streets of Columbus last week, the one who just kept saying, here's my cup, fill it up, then you can honestly say that's a biblical prayer. Psalm 145, 16, God, you open your hand, you satisfy the desires of every living thing. God would say through his prophet Isaiah, why spend money on what's not bread? Why labor on what doesn't satisfy? Listen Listen to me, he said, and eat what is good, and you'll delight in the richest affair. Real fulfillment is found in the presence of the love of God. Got it? Good. Okay. Paul says to the Corinthians first, number one, love does not boast, which means love doesn't need to impress anyone. The Greek word for boast is the word perperuotai. Perperuotai. And it literally translates to strut, to strut or walk around and talk yourself up. Now let me give you an example of this. I heard a story from a young man this week. He talks about when he was little in the third grade, and he always prided himself on being the smartest kid in the class. He actually wasn't, but he thought he was, and that's all that really mattered. And one day a a little girl named Mary joined the class. And Mary was sharp enough because even though she was of her age, she was supposed to be age-wise in the first grade, she was so smart she was actually placed in the third grade. And the day she walked in, it was clear to this little guy he was no longer the smartest kid in the room. And that didn't sit well with him. And one day the teacher, they were sitting in history class, and, and, and the teacher was talking about Ellis Island to the kids. That little island in New York where immigrants would come into America. And she was showing them pictures and telling them all the hardships and stories of these immigrants of Ellis Island. And then she asked the question, has any of you been to Ellis Island? And who puts up their hand but little Mary? And Mary tells everyone this wonderful story of when her mom and daddy took her to Ellis Island and they learned all about her family's roots. And this little guy is just getting more and more upset. Because she's had an experience that's unique to her. And when the teacher asked, has anybody else been to Ellis Island? He said, I've been. Of course, he hadn't been there, but he couldn't admit that he hadn't been there. He wanted the same praise and attention that she got. And he made up this whole story of how his mom and dad took him to Ellis Island. And they got to see this book. And he got to see the names of his ancestors there in this book on Ellis Island. It was such a great story. Now, the problem with this is... That little boy's mom 
was on the school board. And at the end of the year, they had this luncheon where all the teachers would get together with, with, with the school board members. And who would sit next to his mom on the school board but his third grade teacher? And the third grade teacher made the comment, your son told the most wonderful story of your guy's trip to Ellis Island. And, and he looked at his mom like, Mom, be cool. I mean, uh, play along with this, okay? But the mom looked and said, he's never been to Ellis Island. What are you talking about? He was caught. And the Board of Education caught up with his rear end later when he got home after that, if you get my, my meaning. But he embarrassed himself because he was boasting. He was talking himself up. You know, some of you have spent a good deal of your life trying to get somebody's attention. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a guy or a girl within your life. Somebody trying to notice your opinion. To notice what your thoughts were. To show that you were important. When, when you hear laughter at the stories you tell. When you get approval of, of the work that you submit or others light up. When you enter the room, the reaction that others give to you is what makes life worth living to you. But what happens when others don't notice? What happens when others don't applaud you? They don't recognize you? What happens when you don't experience the approval of people that matter to you within your life? It leaves you empty. And you won't find love that way because real love doesn't boast. It doesn't need to impress anybody. Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians 11.30, If I boast, if I must boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. Because where I come to my end is where the love of God is best seen. Because he does some amazing things in my existence. He loves me. The second thing I want you to catch about love is this. Love is not proud. And that means love doesn't need to intimidate anyone. It doesn't need to intimidate anyone. The Greek word here is fusiutai, which means to puff up or to inflate one's chest. It's a negative characteristic of the enemies of God's people. This is what God thinks of it. Habakkuk 2.4, the enemy is puffed up. His desires, they're not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He's arrogant. He's never at rest because he's... Greedy as the grave, and like death, is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations, take captives, all the people. You want some images of what pride means? Think of a pufferfish, or elephant seals, or howler monkeys, or prairie chickens, or those inflatable toads. God made all these self-inflating balloon animals, right? Why do they do that? They do it to appear larger and more intimidating to the other guy. And by the way, they look ridiculous doing it. And if you puff yourself up to intimidate someone else, you might feel superior. You might think you look larger than you really are, but you look ridiculous. And the Corinthians were obsessed with appearances, so much so that they had people splitting themselves over whether they were friends of Paul or Apollos or Peter or others. We would say in this camp, we're followers of the first church of Paul. Or in this camp, we say, we're, we're followers of the assembly of Apollos, and, and we're better than you are. And it was so bad that Paul would actually write this in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14. I thank God, he said, I didn't baptize any of you. Whoa. I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. That's an odd thing to read an evangelist like Paul say, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. But you put it in context and it makes sense. Can you imagine this church in Corinth with one group of people running around saying, listen, you need to listen to what I'm saying. You need to do things my way because, hey, I was taught by the apostle Paul. So I know better than you. I've been around longer than you. I know how things should be run here. And you might think that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. But let me tell you, anytime you're in a fellowship with fallen people, you find power plays at work. Friends, we were all baptized into the same Jesus. More than my word, more than your word, more than my will, more than your will is his 
It's what the head of the church, Jesus Christ, declares his church to be. Your name matters to God, but it's his name that is above every other name. And Jesus never puffed himself up. Listen, some of you here today, you need to be the alpha dog in every conversation. You need to be the alpha dog in every room. You need to make yourself feel large and in charge or appear tough to someone in your sphere of influence. You demand to be respected. You demand to be feared or or, or both. And you believe if you gain the respect of everybody around you, then you'll feel fulfilled in your life. And I'm here to call you out. Friends, it will not work because love is not proud. It doesn't need to intimidate anybody. Here's the third thing. Love doesn't dishonor or it's not rude, which means love doesn't need to drag anyone down. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. The Greek word here means to be shameful or disgraceful. It's the word that they would use if somebody told a perverse joke. Or they made a disgusting or a derogatory comment about somebody of the opposite sex. It means to act without class and without manners. And listen, I I have no illustration here. I just want to cut to the chase. It will always be easier to pull somebody down than it is to, to build somebody up. It's always easier to tear somebody down. People slandering others calling each other names, and social media has just multiplied that by a thousand, right? And as a church, we cannot ever be known as those who pull other people down. We've got to be known as the people of Christ who build one another and build other people up. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage each other and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. There's something about our day and age where, where rudeness seems to be the norm. People, whether they're working in a store or fast food, it's just so hard to find people that are kind and considerate to other people. As believers, we must be. Number four, love is not self-seeking, which means love doesn't need to put itself first. Love is not self-seeking. It doesn't need to put itself first. You know, before my eyes went and I had to give up my license, I was driving on I-70 on the way to Columbus, and you'll know exactly where I'm talking about. It's around Plain City, and if you've been there, you know. Uh, Everybody who travels that section of I-70, the Ohio State Patrol sits right there in the median, right? You you know where it is. They just sit there to catch speeders. And I'm just ballparking it to say, it feels, now that I'm not driving, like 90% of the people on I-70 are speeding. You, You think that too? I mean, people are just flying. And so on this particular day, I'm driving with what I think is the flow of traffic. And I pass this OSP officer in the middle of the median. And I look in my rearview mirror almost instinctively and I see him pull out. And my first thought is, Lord, we got a deal, right? He's not pulling out for me, you know. I'm just going the speed of traffic. And it's bad enough that he pulls onto the road. He pulls over to the lane right behind me and he hits the accelerator. And I'm starting to get nervous, and I think, oh, man, how am I going to explain this to Cheryl when I get the bill for this? And and I'm getting nervous, and I start to edge over to the the lane beside me. Just as my tires cross that, that white line into the service lane, he swerves around me, and he gets the guy in front of me, and I am so happy. I don't know what this guy did, but I don't care. Because at least I didn't pull over. And while I'm filled with relief and gratitude, I had no mercy for the guy that I'd just been following moments before in the flow of traffic. And I realized, come on, Bill. That is a selfish thing to think and do, to be happy when somebody else gets punished and not get the punishment that I deserve. The things went my way, but that doesn't mean it should make me happy. Some of us believe that if we get our way, We'll we'll find meaning and purpose in our life. That if we get the job we want, if we get the house that we want, if we get the car we want, or the spouse we want, or if our needs get met, if we get our way, we'll focus on what's important to our life, and it will become fulfilling. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that's not the case. Because history is filled 
with the stories of, of kings and presidents and billionaires who got everything that they wanted their way and it wasn't enough. It's because they were looking for fulfillment in this world. But there is something worse. Now i got to fly to finish up. Number two is this. When we seek fulfillment in this world, this is the worst. We can develop the disease of self-worship. See, that's what Paul is writing about in these four lines. When we need to be impressive to others, when we need to intimidate others, when we need to be the biggest person in the room, when we need to pull other people down and put them in their place, and we need to put ourselves first, in those moments, it's like we're saying, the universe should revolve around me. It's like we're placing ourselves on the throne of God and saying, my will be done, then I'll be fulfilled. We're laying claim to our own self-importance. We're planting our flag and proclaiming our own little world around us as if we sustain it all and we earn it all. We need people to be impressed by me. Y'all need to respect me. You need to to be beneath me. You you need to put me first. That's the definition of self-worship. In fact, humanity's been doing that from the start of time. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. You can read about it in the Bible all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. In the Garden of Eden, God lays a smorgasbord out before Adam and Eve. All of this garden, every tree in this garden, you can go at it, guys. But one tree, just one, that tree over there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, stay away from that tree. Do not eat that tree. And one day Eve was walking along and the serpent, the devil, says to her, that's all right. God doesn't really want to withhold things from you. Just, just eat the fruit. For God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And Eve said, like God? Sounds good to me. And she ate. And Adam thought being like God sounded good to him too, and so he ate it. See, that's self-worship. To put ourselves in a place where only God ought to be. And, and, and because of that, we have domestic violence in our world today. Because of that, we have war and cancer in our world today. Because of that, we have macular degeneration and dementia and racism and RP. And every corner of humanity has been affected by the disease of self-worship. Romans 3.23 says it so well, all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all been infected by sin and the disease of self-worship, and it is terminal, friends. We're going to die from it, but there is a cure, and that's what I want to close with. Love. Love is the antidote to the disease and an infusion of the character of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. It doesn't matter how bad the disease gets. It doesn't matter how much of sin has metastasized in your life. It doesn't matter how much self-worship you have been involved in, how much you've done. The blood of Jesus washes it all away. Jesus has healed us. He has set us free. He's released us from the terminal diagnosis, and it no longer truly defines us. The truth is we don't have to impress anyone because God loves us as we are his treasured children. The truth is we don't have to intimidate anybody because we serve the king who rules over all of creation. We don't have to pull people down because Jesus lifted us up in our brokenness. The truth is, friends, we don't have to be first because Jesus provided something more glorious than self-worship. He's been exalted above all and provided a cure for our disease. And that cure is his eternal love. When you receive that, when you receive Christ within your life, you can say as Paul does in Romans 8, verse 38, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. He said, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present or the future, nor any power, Neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
cleansed by sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who loved like no other. Friends, you want to find fulfillment? You follow him. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, It was the Son of Man who did not come to be served. He came to serve, and he gave his life for many. I'm going to ask that you stand with me this morning. I want to pray for you, and we're going to sing a closing song. And friends, if you have a need to give your life to Christ, to open your existence to the love that is unlike any other, this is the time to do it. If you're looking for a church home, a church family with which to worship, to plant the flag of Christ within your existence, let this be the time you place your membership. But before you make a decision, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we all fall short. We know the disease because we all want to be first. (laughs) We all want to be noticed. Even the most humble of us can't stand an unnoticed existence. It's agonizing. But Father, it doesn't exist. There has never been a time, there has never been a moment, even before we were created, that your mind, that your gaze was not fixed upon us. Before we were ever created within our mother's wombs, you knew how we would be formed. You knew the circumstances in which we would be born. You knew the things that we would have, the things we would not have. You knew the influences that we would be blessed by and the influences that would challenge us in this life. You knew that we would be a people prone to boast. You knew that we would be a people prone to being rude and self-seeking. And yet, Father, you know that all we need truly is your love. You're the gold standard. You always have been. You always will be. And we want to be more like you. So, Father, I just ask that for us as a church family, remind us of the antidote for those in this room and those beyond these walls that that are still suffering in that disease of self-worship and from the effects of it. Help us to be carriers of that antidote. Help us to spread the good news, the gospel, into the power and the lives of everyone we meet. For with you, we have fulfillment. And with you, we have the only satisfaction our souls long for. I pray this in Jesus' name.